Hello Avatar fans and welcome to the next episode of the Avatar Online podcast. This is going to be our review special for the new comic uh, Legend of Korra Runes of the Empire Part 2 which was just released this week. Uh, this is the official podcast for the fan site AvatarTheLastAirbenderOnline.com. I'm going to be your main host for this episode, Morgan, Airspeed Prime. And joining me on the podcast is Greg, Greg2B from the site. What's up everyone? Excellent. So, uh, before, just before we get into the review for Runes of the Empire Part 2, we do have one small piece of news, also comic related. I think it's interesting enough, even if it's um, nothing like super new. So, a new product listing um, has gone up uh, thanks to uh, Penguin Random House. The title is Avatar The Last Airbender The Promise Omnibus. And then when you go into the details, you find out that this is a book that's going to be releasing uh, June. 30th 2020 that's actually the furthest uh, dark horse book off into the future that we have and in the details we get that this uh, they're specifically saying this is the first time this series is being collected as an omnibus and if you look into the details you'll find out it's uh, 224 pages uh, which means it's just enough space with the page count for the three parts of the promise and then basically the credits pages uh, to show off the covers for the individual parts inside and that's it the other interesting thing about this is the size of the book it's actually going to be the same dimensions as one of the individual parts so this is very much a sort of trimmed down smaller version uh, of the library edition of the promise it's going to have the cover the same cover image that the promise library edition had just in that smaller kind of form factor uh, of the typical comics so it's just going to be that uh, small size but really thick book here to collect uh, all parts of the promise together uh, and then I think the retail price is like $24.99, um, which compares to like each individual part costing $10.99. So you save like, what, um, like $8 pretty much on this. So that so seems pretty interesting. And I assume this is going to be something we get for the other books. So in a few months time, I assume the search omnibus is going to be revealed and so on as a way to sort of reprint these books again. Uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on uh, this sort of surprising announcement of a kind of new editions of the comics, with starting with the promise here? Yeah, no, it definitely is surprising. I didn't really, I don't know, I mean, it's not a new thing in comics to see, you know, this sort of format or whatever, but I didn't, I don't know, it seemed like they were really, you know, it was either you have the, the individuals or you have sort of the library hardcover ones and all of their sort of like coolness that those have. So this is interesting. It's another, I mean, it's a nice another format for it. I guess if you didn't have them already and you want to, you know, a collection of them without buying them individually after the fact, it would be a nice thing to do. I mean, I think for me, this would be a cool thing to have because I don't really want like the heavy hardback ones. Um, but this would be something more that I would like want in the beginning rather than after the fact so i don't know it's interesting that they have it i'm not i guess it's more market towards like sort of like after the thought type of people rather than sort of anyone else but um i don't know it's interesting it's definitely cool yeah i ultimately think like this is something that ended up actually being needed because i think for a lot of people the extras in the library editions really don't have any appeal to them I, the book mm. is kind of a bit too big just because of the annotations primarily the concept art is fine but it's not particularly great so those hardcovers do tend to just be they're there in the collection uh, but you never really pull that out if you want to read the promise you go for the individual parts and for me that's kind of the appeal of this of like I'd kind of like to have these as just the the copies that I sort of keep beside my desk if I need to refer to something in the comics rather than having to like sort through all the individual parts I just have here's the promise in one book and um, so it's a stack of you know five six books instead of a stack of 15 so um, I, I think that's the the appeal of that to anyone who knows the comics but uh, this is a new edition and then of course for anyone new getting into it like as we talked about like we re-reviewed the promise on the last podcast like you almost forget that the book is like seven years old so um while they do reprints of them of course to keep the book in print um occasionally these books are sort of tricky to find at times especially the search i think especially on amazon like part one of the search can go out of stock i know a lot of people were kind of commenting in some of my videos where i talk about like how to get into the comics about like 
the search library edition is like never in stock anywhere and this sort of solves that problem of like the full collected edition at a cheaper price and a way to keep it in print longer so this is going to be cool to see how they um kind of uh, look in person of course when it's closer to coming out uh, and yeah it's just a, a nice thing to do um, maybe it suggests that we're getting close to getting the announcements of the next comics that are coming given that they're putting up product listings for new products but uh, we're still waiting on the next day avatar and the next core comic to be announced but it's something interesting at least but yeah, we'll move from there into the main topic of this episode, which is our review, uh, our big discussion here for the newest comic here, which is Legend of Korra, Runes of the Empire Part 2. This was released just earlier this week on Tuesday, everywhere, uh, digitally, um, online, physical copies, comic book store release date was the day after that on Wednesday, so it's completely out, um, very different than the Team Avatar Tales release, and so yeah, we're, we're, we're past the halfway point of Runes of the Empire now, and we're here to discuss it, so I definitely recommend if you have your copy, uh, taking it out and reading along with us, because that's what we're going to be doing here to go through it. But we'll start off with some general thoughts on the book to get us started. So, Greg, overall, what were your thoughts on part two of Runes of the Empire? Um, overall, I thought it was okay. I think for the most part, it had, I think, what I was expecting to have it just from, you know, having seen like sort of like enough of the preview pages and, you know, reading the back of the other ones. So, you know, you kind of knew a good amount of what was actually going to happen in this one. I think, you know, the parts that I didn't know were nice to sort of see them. I think they had a nice couple nice couple small parts in here and a couple of things that I didn't I didn't quite see how they were gonna sort of put them together. Um but you know I think for the most part for it being I guess sort of the middle one and sort of pushing things along, I think it did a pretty good job with that. I think it had probably maybe one or two parts that I was more excited for that I didn't know would be in here or that didn't know that they would have as much of it. Um, but other than that, I think it was just, you know, it was overall, it was just pretty okay for what I was looking for. So I think it definitely, it moves things along in sort of like the right sort of pace, um, I think, at least as far as where it seems like they're going. I think they have, I don't know, I think they might have a lot more to do in the third book that I might have been expecting sort of initially. Um, so I'm interested to see how that sort of gets resolved. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with that, that I think this book did exactly what a, you expect a part two to do, and really not a lot more than that. And it's a little disappointing because it is Runes of the Empire, because everyone's hyped to see what happens with Kuvira. I felt part two was just a little light on giving us stuff with Kuvira. Like, this is the middle part, it's meant to be the, the detail oriented part as we transition from the intro towards the the kind of finale of the book uh, I I just feel that like it might end up by the end of Rings of the Empire being a little bit of a negative that they held back too much uh, in part one and part two on the Kavira stuff and are keeping way too much for the conclusion and is it going to be that situation once again where it's all on part three part three has to resolve every single plot point and deliver the big um, character moments it has a lot to live up to now because this book was, you know, solid, as I said, did what it needed to. Some interesting new stuff, like keeping Wu in play as, like, an important character, and that arc isn't done yet. But I definitely was a little disappointed that we didn't get more with Kuvira, that they've left everything for, for part two. That's more or less where I stand on this. I still think it's a very, very good book. It's definitely a huge improvement over the recent books that we've had, like Imbalance Part 3 and Team Avatar Tales. It's, it keeps up the good quality from Runes of the Empire Part 1. But um, I definitely think there probably should have been something bigger with Kuvira that happened here, and not just keep it all for Part 3. But anyway, uh, we'll get into it, and we'll go through it page by page and point out where the book succeeds and maybe doesn't succeed. So we start off here at the uh, airship here, and uh, Korra and Wu are about to head off into the swamp to try and recruit Toph, because this was the plot point at the end of part one, where they came up with the plan that if Guan is running for governor of Gaoling, the only person who can possibly counter him is going to be Toph, the sort of hometown hero from Gaoling. 
So we get uh, the the goodbyes here, uh, the the Korosami kiss moment here, because we don't really get a lot of Korosami here uh, in terms of the stuff we expect from Turf Wars here. So they say goodbye to each other, goodbye kiss, um, and we see Wu is bringing the bug spray with him. He's in this sort of adventurer out uh, outfit, and as they head off, we discover that they're being watched uh, from uh, the the kind of area surrounding the airship by Earth Empire guards. So Guan is spying on them and they're now about to to move now that Korra has left. So what are your thoughts on these uh, opening three pages? Um, no, it's pretty good. I mean, it's sort of what we've come to expect. I think it's nice that they have sort of Wu and sort of the bug spray, just, you know, him and his whole getup. I think, you know, I, I think if nothing else, they've kept him pretty much in character while trying to sort of like grow him as a person throughout this book so i think they're they've done a good job of that Mm -hmm. uh next everyone moves inside the airship and they're preparing it to head to zaufu uh asami and kuvira have a little bit of a back and forth here kuvira wants to be let out of the sort of platinum prison she's been put in but asami is very much like no sue's told me she has a nice cell waiting for you in zaufu uh, and she just jokes, you know, trading another platinum prison for another. Just setting up the idea, Kavira can't just metal bend out of this because, of course, metal benders can't bend platinum. Um, and, uh, yeah, they discover that there's some problems here, uh, you know, engine trouble. Um, Kavira's like, you should probably let me out of here right now. As the Earth Empire guards, you know, uh, swing in through the windows, everything smashes. They're being attacked from all sides here. Bolin can't bend, of course, because they're on a metal airship. He has no earth, no lava. So it's left for pretty much um, uh, Mako with his firebending and then Asami to fend off this massive amount of Earth Empire guards. Bolin's hitting people with a chair over the place. So they're, they're, they're fighting a good fight here against the odds here, but they are eventually getting taken down by the, the metal whips and so on. The brothers get like smashed into each other and they're fairly quickly rounded up and in the middle of this Kuvira is like begging like a Sami let me out I can help you but of course the rest of the group still doesn't really trust her uh, because of of who she is of course she hasn't gained that trust and everyone is captured as Guan walks in so what are your thoughts on this uh, opening action sequence of the book? Yeah, no, I think this is, I don't know, it's a nice little sequence. I mean, it's, it's too bad Bolin couldn't have figured out how to, like, get Earth from, like, the outside surrounding area, because that definitely would have helped their chances in this battle. But overall, I think, you know, for what they're trying to go for here, you know, they're not sort of trusting Kavira yet because of, you know, everything that she's just done in the past. It's not it's not too surprising, but you can see that, you know, this setup was, as soon as they started to have an engine problem, of course, they're going to get ambushed. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to see this a lot, like, over this book, basically. Kuvira wanting to help. I think also <laughs> as, view, as readers, like, believing that she is going to help if they allow her to. But her past behavior, basically, meaning that no one really trusts her. And the frustration from Kuvira's side of things, but also the understanding, I think, her reflection that, oh, yeah, there's a reason why this stuff isn't going my way. And in, in general, I thought they did a good job at this in that, like, you have to have your main character lose this fight. So powerful benders like, you know, Mako and Bo Lin have to lose a fight to sort of just, you know, Earth Empire goons who aren't that effective. Um, but I thought they did a good job at getting across how against the odds that they were uh, in that, like, Mako is your only real sort of, you know, powerhouse here in that, like, Asami doesn't have her shock glove on, so she's not as effective and so on. So, you know, they did a good job at kind of getting across that there are other factors at play here. And if everyone was ready to go, probably if Bolin had any amount of Earth, it probably would have went very differently. So, pretty good start. So, then we get the uh, traveling through the swamp here. So, they're, they're walking through, we see all the bugs, we get to see the different vines and stuff like that. Um, and, yeah, so... They have to find out where she is, like, they're questioning, like, wait, you, you saw Toph before, Korra, how do you not know where she is? And Korra obviously just points out, it's a swamp, it's very confusing, there's not really directions. So she uses her sort of energy bending within the swamp, tapping into it to connect to where she is, to immediately find her. As Korra is doing this, Wu goes off to take a pee, and, um, basically he has a swamp vision like we've seen before in the swamp. 
and his vision is of Queen Hu Ting. So the, the dead queen comes back from the dead to speak to uh, Wu here. Uh, the Avatar can't help you now. You've lost your way. You're nothing but a weak king and a disgrace to the throne. Uh, I entrusted you with my kingdom and you've made a mess of it. Wu says, no, I'm trying to change things and make the Earth Kingdom better. Uh, she says, people don't want change. They don't, wa they don't care about progress. What they truly desire is stability. But what about freedom? People should have a say in who leads them. Stop fooling yourself. You're only pushing for democracy because you're too scared to rule on your own. No, that's not true. And she finishes up here by saying, After I died, you handed the Earth Kingdom right over to Kavira, and now that you've finally regained the crown, you're ready to give uh, give away all your power just like you did before. And Wu's getting very upset here at this uh, statement, and he's like, no, that's not true, as Korra comes over to him, and he sort of says what just happened. Um, she just kind of helps him through it, and is like, yeah, I should have warned you, the swamp loves to mess with people's heads, and they head off to Toffs. So what are your thoughts on uh, this first section here in the swamp, specifically, I suppose, the, the vision of the queen here, which is pretty important? Yeah, no, I thought that was pretty cool how they actually brought that in there. I mean, that's that's sort of what we come to expect from anyone going into the swamp. So <clears throat> I thought that was pretty cool to see him sort of have this vision and have it sort of, you know, reflect on everything that he's, you know, had to go through in the past and losing the power, getting it back and just sort of his way of dealing with things. I, I like that he at least initially tries to sort of like speak up for himself or speak up for his ideas that does, you know, definitely show some progress. But, you know, clearly, you know, you can see that it has affected him a good bit by the end of it. Yeah, and, and this is an interesting one to discuss here because we'll see that Wu it begins to really think about this and kind of question his decisions that he's made up to now. And they they seem to treat what the, the vision says here fairly seriously with regards to is this the right direction for the Earth Kingdom? in that is this like too quick is this too much change too quickly for an earth kingdom that has only just got a bit of stability back after book three and four and um, is Wu taking the easy way out is basically the question here the fact that he's able to make some of these decisions shows that he has potential as a leader but he's sort of moving away from being the king before he even has a opportunity to do anything is he being sort of a coward with all of this and I, I really like that actually for the character that you know th you're sort of contrasting some of the real growth that he had with the fact that he wants to go off and become a singer or a dancer or whatever he said and he he sang basically his announcement of the elections and uh, you know the, just that sort of contrast between the, the serious part of him and the sort of more goofy part of him uh what, what's your take on where this book kind of goes with Wu and what it seems to suggest for part three? Do you do you see him maybe agreeing with the idea of like canceling the elections and taking the role of king at least for the time being or, or what? Yeah, no, that's a good one because, you know, there is that whole issue and how that would actually deal with, you know, sort of the forces that are currently at play and I know it seems like he wants to sort of given to that idea just because it also seems like the easy route at this time but you no know, that being the easy route might not be you know necessarily the best thing to do so I don't know I think I don't know I think he I don't know it seems to me like they're probably going to go through with having the elections but I don't know I guess I wouldn't be surprised to see him have maybe enough growth that he would be you know in charge of at least you know one sort of you know province or area of the earth kingdom rather than just sort of giving it all the way and sort of figuring out how to do that just him sort of like maybe taking a, a slower sort of step in responsibility but not sort of giving it all away mm -hmm. uh, from there we cut to everyone being captured by guan so guan and kavira have a bit of a conversation uh, he asks her, are you ready to return and serve the Earth Empire again? And she just says, no, I won't be returning. Uh, and I serve no one, not the Avatar, and especially not you. He then reveals that, of course, Mako, Asami, and Bolin are hooked up to these machines here. And uh, something's about to happen. Kavira demands that they all be released. But um, here we get, I suppose, what's effectively like our introduction of Dr. Shang in terms of like the details of her. You know, you remember her, don't you? Uh, she worked very closely with your former fiancé. 
and Kavira is asking, what is all of this? And he says, this is how the Earth Empire will regain power and keep it. Dr. Sheng explains, after Batar Jr. left to become your second in command, I began researching more effective methods to re-educate the prisoners you sent to our camps. I discovered that the Dai Li had maintained order in Ba Sing Se for centuries by using enhanced indoctrination techniques. You mean brainwashing, is what Kavira says. And she continues, um, But while the Dai Li's methods were useful, they were also unreliable. More often than not, the re-educated subjects would revert to their old selves. So I began experimenting with magnetic waves to alter the brain. By combining modern technology with ancient uh, techniques, I was able to dramatically increase effectiveness. She learned how to control people's minds and make it stick. Um, but you surrendered before I could share my wonderful breakthrough with you. Kavira counters this by saying, if you had, I would have shut you down. I never authorized such inhumane experiments. Uh, she says, maybe not directly, but you don't act so naive. You demanded results from your followers. You never cared how we achieved them. Um, and Kavira disagrees with this and says, I would hoped those who had gone astray would see the error in their ways. I wanted them to be motivated by my strength and leadership, not by some machine. Uh, and he goes through with it uh, as he's about to flip the switch. Kavira again appeals to it and says to Asami, you have to know I didn't mean for any of this to happen. And this is where we get Kavira witnessing the, the rest of Team Avatar being all brainwashed. So pretty important scene here to explain the brainwashing. Uh, what are your thoughts on how this was done? Yeah, no, I thought that was pretty good how they did that actually, how they sort of, you know, brought back how it was done in the past and how to sort of modernize things. I think, you know, that's, you know, a trend that we've just seen in, in the core comics and just, you know, core's time in general is just sort of improving and sort of understanding the traditions and sort of, you know, modernizing it and upgrading it to now. So, yeah, no, I think, you know, the introdu introduction of how it works, I mean, you can definitely, you know, see from how they designed it that, you know, it's not sort of like super advanced or anything like that, but, you know, it's taking, you know, the current technology of the time and sort of, you know, the you know, sort of metal hats and all that sort of stuff to sort of, you know, alter their brain waves. They don't, you know, it's not like they're going to give you any sort of like real, like, you know, sort of like technical sort of breakdown of it. But, you know, you can see, you know, just from the way that they sort of, you know, draw it on the pages, how much it sort of affects the characters. And, you know, later on, you see how effective it actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I think comment on here is that, um, I do actually believe Kuvira when she sort of argues with Dr. Shang that like she would never have gone that far to approve like brainwashing and stuff like that. When she talks about how want she wanted to motivate her, her troops by strength and leadership, not by machines. I do actually uh, agree with that. I, I don't think this is kind of Kuvira sort of lying to herself about what she would have done. Um, I think it is meant to show that like Dr. Shang is willing to go above and beyond and um, kind of like the way in book four like Varric had that kind of moment where he realized wow the spirit of mind technology is too dangerous we should shut this down which seemed like a crazy thing for him to say but he, you saw the sort of that he does actually have some like ethics Dr. Shang clearly doesn't especially when led by um, Commander Guan here so uh, I, I do like this scene overall to just get that across that Kuvira I see her being very honest here in terms of not wanting the rest of Team Avatar to be brainwashed here and her final appeal to Asami is like, you know, just doing everything she can to get across that I'm not behind this and, and all that sort of stuff. But uh, what are your thoughts on, on that dynamic uh, going on this scene? Do you, do you, how, how much do you believe Kuvira? Do you think she would have approved the brainwashing or not? I don't know. That's a good, that's a good thought to have. Um, I don't know. I don't think... I think from sort of the initial idea i don't know i can't see her like sort of like straight up saying sort of like figure out how to brainwash people in order to do this but at the same point where you know they make the comment of her just sort of wanting to see results i could see that also sort of going for you know kuvira as well because she does you know she definitely wants to see the sort of you know just the end sort of results although you know you definitely can see that she definitely does want to you know lead by sort of strength and leadership and by sort of valor but you know at different times she's not above sort of manipulating people to sort of get you know her sort of way um which would go as far as to sort of straight up brainwash people i don't know i don't i don't i want to say that she probably wouldn't have at least authorized 
realized it directly, but you know, the whole idea of the re-education camps, I mean, that sort of idea and sort of thinking that those people will sort of see your strength and leadership. I mean, I don't know, maybe like, maybe like, you know, one percent of the people in those sort of situations might might see that sort of thing, but you no. Know, Overall, I can't see people really, from that sort of standpoint, sort of getting that sort of viewpoint from her as a, as a person, as a leader. Maybe from like the towns that she leads and sort of controls. Maybe like you know from like the younger generations or something like that, which is essentially sort of like brainwashing or indoctrinating, just in sort of like a different way. Um, so I don't know. I, I think it's sort of mixed as far as you know, would she approve this? Would she not approve this? Or would she just sort of use these methods? Mm. Yeah, definitely, like, Kavira as, like, a villain trying to redeem herself definitely sort of needs to explain why she even went as far as to make re-education camps and why she seemed to just, you know, put everyone who is not of Earth Kingdom origin in them and mm -hmm. that, that that needs an explanation. Now, ultimately, like, the re-education camp aspect of it, I think, was just, like, a, a name to put on it when it was just, like, slave camps, effectively. That seems to be... Mm -hmm. The way, like, Baraz and Anna were, were treated when we met them, it didn't really seem like there was any sort of, like, convincing them to do anything. It was just, yeah, we'll use you to help the Empire with <laughs> by working. But uh, anyway, that, that, that is stuff that she does need to explain. Uh, but uh, we cut to uh, the quick introduction here of Toph. They arrive at uh, the cave she's living in. She doesn't seem to be there, but of course, Korra sensed her through the vine. She knows she's here. As Wu walks by the wall, he notices that uh, Toph has sort of uh, earth bent herself into the wall, um, and she's this is I suppose her first time properly meeting uh, Wu, so he says it's an honor, and he, she just says no offense, but uh, I've never been a fan of the monarchy, and they just have to quickly explain to her, you know, you know Kavira surrendered, didn't you? Yep, and Wu just ends by saying, well, it turns out not everyone surrendered, and we're going to get the details of this scene uh, in a little bit, but. Uh, any thoughts on this uh, intro to Toph in the comic here? Um, I mean, this seems like a fun way to sort of introduce her to Wu, just her sort of like hiding out in the rocks, you know, on the side of where she's currently living. Um, but no, I thought it was just a nice little way to introduce her. Mm -hmm. I do like the little panel, though, on the, the final page of that section there, where you do get Toph, like, earth bending two rocks together to, like, make the spark. That's a, a nice little clever bending application that... You wouldn't usually see the comics do, but I like that they actually give it a somewhat big panel of just two rocks, you know, <laughs> putting the fire on. But um, anyway, so here we, we cut back to the brainwashing here. Uh, Dr. Shang saying, you will obey Commander Guan's orders. Bo Lin repeats it and says, I will obey Commander Guan's orders. The Avatar is no longer your friend. This is the line that Mako repeats. And then for Asami, very specifically here, Korra is your enemy. And Asami says, Korra is my enemy. Uh, this is when Gawan decides that actually uh, Kuvira is up next. Put her in the chair, brainwash her, because uh, he and Dr. Shang had discussed in the last volume that they would like to have a re-educated re Kuvira on their side. So this is Ku Kuvira's opportunity. As Asami, brainwashed Asami, takes Kuvira out of the uh, Platinum prison, she uses this opportunity with her hands free to... Um, break out she has to unfortunately like you know kick and like bash uh bolin and asami together but she does manage to sort of uh, make her escape in all of this um so what are your thoughts here on uh, seeing the brainwash team avatar for the first time and then uh, kavira's escape um yes yeah, so i mean i don't know it's interesting to see how they sort of react to sort of the brainwashing because it seems like you know at least when, you know, Asami's sort of letting her out that she mentions, like, you're finally getting your wish, we're letting you out. So, I don't know, it's interesting to see how they're acting, I guess, sort of under the brainwashing, whether they have, like, you know, access to, or just, like, memories, or how they sort of, I guess, how their sort of, like, speech patterns actually work, um, you know, regarding, I guess, just working in this sort of situation. But, yeah, no, I mean, Kuvera, she gets out, you know... Not, like, super easily, but, you know, you can see how skilled she is and how she's able to sort of manipulate, you know, just the whole fact that, of course, the whole camp is metal and they're, she's a metal bender that, you know, she doesn't have too much issue. We actually see her do some, like, regular earth bending here as well, which was cool to see for once. Um, but, yeah, no, she definitely figures out a way to get out of there for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, and yeah, I actually do like the line, I may have surrendered to the Avatar, but I'm not about to surrender to you, that, like, 
Kavira is very prideful as a character, so you know, <laughs> the idea of surrendering like for her was a big deal, but she notes that I surrendered to Korra specifically because like from a certain point of view, like she respects Korra's power. She understands that like like she will never be as powerful as Korra is. Um, and she won't surrender to Guam because she doesn't respect him in that way. And it's interesting to view it. Is it just is, is this just her pride, or is it honest respect for Cora that I'm um, I'm willing to like follow Cora, or or what? It's just an interesting one. But uh, yeah, I agree. Her escape's pretty cool to see her, her use some more normal earth bending, and then the clever way you know it really gets across you know just how skilled she is that. Uh, as she sneaks off, she puts on an Earth Empire outfit. Just now that she's undercover, just hops in one of the kind of uh, the the jeeps sort of nearby and just drives off with everyone else. And she just takes a, a different road to everyone else, and she's she's out. It was complete like Metal Gear Solid type stuff here from Kavira, so that was, uh, <laughs> pretty cool to see. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we we cut back over to uh, Toph, Korra, and Wu here. And yeah, so they in between pa- in between panels they've explained to her the whole we want you to be governor. Uh, governor Toph Bei Fong has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Sounds like this Guan character is a real piece of work. I would love to put that guy in his place. So it's a yes, it's a no. And Toph's explanation for saying no to this is Ang Katara and Sokka lived for all that political hoo ha. Me, I always saw the government as a giant pool of mud. Anyone who falls into it is gonna come out filthy. Count me out. And Cora says, which is why, which is what makes you perfect for the job. You'll tell it like it is. You're incorruptible. And Toph just says, if you haven't noticed, I hate being around people. What makes you think I want to be of service to them? Uh, but don't you want to make a positive difference in Gaoling at your home state? I despised growing up there. Wu pipes up and says, I think it was a mistake coming here, Cora. Maybe Auntie Hu Ting was right after all. Cora says, that's it. Wu, wait. She starts whispering to 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 him, and Toph can't hear this. And she's like, "Wait, what? What are you whispering about over there?" And Cora, with a grin on her face, just says, "Oh, just the swamp vision Wu saw on her way here. I told him to ignore it." Toph freaks out and says, "What? That's terrible advice. The swamp is very wise. Sit, tell me everything." And he says, "I saw the former Earth Queen. She got me doubting my plan to make the Earth Kingdom a democracy." And what else did she say? That people don't really want change. And Toph says, hmm, is that so? She also insisted that the, that the people would much rather stick to what feels safe and secure than do anything outside their comfort zone. And Cora says, didn't you once tell me that the swamp will teach you what you need to learn if you're open to listening? Huh? Did I say that? I hate it when I'm right. Fine, I'll run for governor. And Wu hugs Toph. And that ends this sequence. Um, I like the the dialogue back and forth here. It's fun seeing you know older Toph and uh, very experienced and just wanting no involvement in politics whatsoever. I like you know Cora knowing she has something that can get Toph involved and stuff like that. But I think there is a bit of a disconnect with what they're trying to get at and what suddenly makes Toph actually decide to do it. Because it was something Hu Ting said to Wu, and they're just relaying this to Toph, and this suddenly makes Toph be like, oh fine, I'm in because I told you to listen to the swamp. And it's like, wait, are you trying to apply the knowledge that was meant to be delivered to Wu to Toph? I think this could have been made so much clearer what specifically they were going for. I get the idea here of just using Toph's trust of the swamp sort of against her. But um, it wasn't particularly clear for me. Usually you can tell what's going on from like the bolded words. But even here it's just like, don't really want change, safe, secure, outside their comfort zone. So are they just applying those things to Toph that Toph doesn't like politics so she'll do something outside her comfort zone? It just seemed a little convoluted in how they were getting to the, the conclusion here. But uh, Greg, what were your thoughts on that? This this big scene here with Toph. Hmm. Yeah. No. That's that's interesting. I mean, yeah. I mean, it definitely seems like they're more or less just sort of manipulating the information that was given to Wu and sort of relaying that on the Toph in the way that they know will sort of get Toph to sort of help. You no. Know, 
there's certain cause and situation. I mean, you can see that that's sort of what Cora is sort of planning this whole time, especially with the whole sort of like whispering and, you know, just sort of setting that up here. So, I mean, I don't know. I think they're just trying to sort of use it just towards their advantage here. Cause I don't think, you know, it's not something that Wu, you know, himself, he doesn't really have that much of a connection with Toph or anything like that in order to know, you know, what will really sort of get her sort of on his you know, side or, you know, to help the sort of situation here. I mean, I don't know. It seems kind of interesting that this would be, I don't know, I guess maybe this is just sort of how tough it is now that, you know, just sort of her with her own sort of like spiritual sort of awareness now that she's, you know, at least in that aspect, a lot more open to that sort of idea and that sort of change, which is something that, you know, we're still sort of waiting to see sort of in the younger toss. So it's interesting to see that contrast for sure, since we were just talking about how, you know, it seems like we see Toph make a step forward and then like a step back. So, you no, know, it's interesting to see that, you know, she has, at least at this point in her age, has the ability to sort of like change. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think what they're going for is just sort of getting her sort of the, into the situation. I mean, I don't know, maybe it seems like she gives into it a little bit too easy since she does sort of, you know, have the whole thing about, you know, how, you know, Katara and Aang and Sokka and all of them were sort of like for the politicalness and she, you know, never really was for that even when she was in sort of like, you know, positions of sort of like leadership with like, you know, like the police force and stuff like that. So I don't know, I think it'll be interesting to see how this continues on since, you know, she's still, you know, even later on, they make the whole comment of her sort of still not really wanting to do this. Um, but, you know, they're still in it for now. So I don't know. I think it's one of the things that I might have to see how it sort of really plays out. Yeah. Like it, it, this will very much depend on in part three, do they go ahead with the elections or not? What decision does Wu make? What, what does he take from what the, the queen said to him? Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll, we'll we'll go from there pretty much. But um, uh, next we see uh, Kavira on the lookout because of course she's still on the run. Uh, she realizes she's safe, uh, but uh, that she's on her own. She doesn't know what to do now. She looks over and realizes that, that there's a radio in the car she stole. Um, but she's on her own. No one trusts her. Does she have anyone to turn to? Given that Cora and Wu went off into the swamp with no radio. Um, the others were captured, so what does she do? I do also find it interesting here that Kuvira is free, effectively, at this point. Like, if she wanted to, she could escape at this point. Because she, she has the car here, she's incredibly resourceful and powerful. She could do whatever she needs to do to pretty much escape and get, get completely out of the way of anyone trying to find her again. But she specifically stays here and realizes that it's what she has to do is contact someone who was there for her once so so that's what she says you were there for me once and this is where we go into our flashback sequence for part two it's just two pages the same like part one and here's what it has so um we see little kuvira in the back of the cart um as her father is uh, bringing her to zao fu your mother and i have tried to get through to you kuvira but you refuse to listen you have no discipline and no remorse for what you did. There's a master metal bender here who agreed to take you off our hands. Hopefully she can knock some sense into you. And remember, this is all for your own good. As Kuvira is left on her own here at the front gate of Zhao Fu, uh, a younger Sue walks out and says, You must be Kuvira. It's nice to meet you. My name is Su Yin, but you can call me Sue. You'll be safe here, I promise. Suyin puts her hand out, little Kuvira takes it, and we come out of the flashback with uh, present day Kuvira saying, I only hope you'll be there for me again. And she decides that she is going to radio Sue. So what's your take on this? Uh, Just two pages of backstory, continuing directly on from the backstory we got in part one, but still not a ton of it. What's your interpretation of these two pages? Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, getting 
any bit more of this, I think, is always sort of worth it. I mean, yeah, you know, maybe we could have wanted more. And, you know, I feel like, you know, the story will continue on in the next part of um, the book. I mean, it would have been nice to get it here, but I don't know. You know, the way that at least they have the book laid out right now, it wouldn't really have fit in anywhere else because they didn't really have that much time. But, you know, it's interesting just to get to see, you know, when Sue and Kavir first met, just to see sort of like, you know, the age sort of difference that they have and see, you know, how she at least initially sort of introduced herself. So definitely, you know, is a welcome you no know, part to get, you know, at least this little bit of their backstory here. Mm, yeah, Th- this is good because it does get across the idea of like, this is how Kuvira viewed meeting Sue for the first time. It was Sue being there for her, saving her from being abandoned by her parents here. Um, I think it is inter- interesting to sort of connect part one and two and the, the stories together in regards to like, um, how much blame do you place on her parents versus, you know, how responsible do you hold Kuvira for her, you know, behavior as a child? And that with part one, a lot of the discussion was like, um, you know, the whole, she broke the vase, she's saying she didn't do it, but her parents are like, you did do it. So is it just her parents being terrible and blaming everything on her or did she do it and she's lying and it, it fit into like the theme of part one, which was, Kuvira not taking responsibility for the things that she did do and now present day she has to redeem herself you know by taking responsibility making amends for what she's done so is this her parents um being maybe somewhat justified of like she is sort of out of control she doesn't have any remorse for the things that she does she doesn't have any discipline uh, or are we meant to view it as just her parents were terrible, uh, they <laughs> blamed everything on her, uh, Kavira wasn't really at fault for what went on, and she's just being abandoned here. Either way, it is her parents ultimately just sort of, you know, abandoning her effectively, giving her away, that they can't control her, so they're going to give her to Sue. Um, what's your take on this with regards to, like, how you view Kavira's parents in this, and, um, how you view like where Kuvira was as a child in regards to like character flaws and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I think that's probably the hardest thing and probably what we would want the most of just sort of getting, you know, a backstory even before this part of the backstory. Cause it seems like we're going to get sort of the whole sort of idea of how, you know, Sue and Kuvira sort of met and the whole you know connection that they have. But I think, you know, at this point we can sort of gather that. I think the idea of, you know, Kuvira as a young character is a lot more sort of unclear because I mean yeah she's you know in the last one she like broke through the wall and you know we see her having conflict with her parents but we don't really get you know at least I don't really see a clear idea of where she's at as a character I mean you know at this point here I mean it seems like she's more just like a scared young child but there's not really enough to see if she was sort of like you know a bad apple or bad egg or whatever just sort of you know being a bad kid in general i don't think you know there's quite enough to go on on that so i'm not really sure maybe that's something that we'll sort of see as you know we see sue raise career how that sort of you know dynamic work i think that would probably be the best clue that we have to how you know career is as a young child yeah because ultimately like what we want to explain with career is how this relationship which seems to start off fairly positive sue takes kuvira in teaches her bending i assume and stuff like that uh, she's in like one of the wealthiest places on the on the planet effectively she's in a, a good position we don't know the specifics of how sue raises her in regards to like does she live in the same house as like the the other uh, Bayfong kids and stuff like that those specifics we don't know yet but how do we get from ba- being adopted daughter to I disagree with you over this one decision now I'll go as far as to take over like the entire earth empire create re-education camps that uh, discriminate against people not from the earth kingdom you know willing to make these uh, weapons of like mass destruction with the spirit vines and do all of this stuff just over a disagreement you you from book four, like, you get the connection they were trying to make of, like, Kavira felt abandoned by her parents. She wanted to make it so that no one in the Earth Kingdom was ever felt abandoned again. She felt Sue was abandoning people by not taking on the leadership role. 
you can see it, but you you need a little bit more depth there. Um, the problem is that like four pages of backstory still feels like we're at the very beginning of like Kuvira, and unless we get a good amount of backstory in part three, is there going to be enough time? Given that they have to introduce Batar again, uh, they have to do all this plot stuff with the brainwashing and those character dynamics, and um, they're gonna, I suppose, have to reference the start of the story again with the, going back to the trial to resolve something with Kuvira. Sue and Kuvira are gonna have to interact in the present day. There'll be some backstory, but will it be enough in terms of catching us up with, you know, this many years of backstory to? give us the depth that we actually want um so i suppose how confident are you that they'll be able to deliver on all of this in, in part three hmm that's a good question i don't know that's because it seems like they have you know that's probably the one thing that i do wonder the most is it seems like now they have even more ground to cover i, I don't see them sort of covering that in any sort of like full way i think there's definitely going to still be some gaps there um you know i wonder about sort of just the, re the resolutions that they have to go especially with sort of how this book ends and how they have to you know also bring into the sort of group and seeing how that sort of dynamic works i think there's going to be even more that they actually have to work on um so i don't know i think i don't know i think we're going to get some of it but i don't think we're going to get the full sort of idea i think that's probably going to take more than what we have you no know, time for mm-hmm but uh, next up, we cut to Zhao Fu. We see Sue receiving the radio call from Kuvira. Uh, she's like, what's going on? Asami said she was bringing you here. Kuvira says, stealing Gao Ling, we never left. And immediately Sue is like, what did you do to Asami and the others? Nothing. Um, and she ex tries to explain it. Commander Guan and his rebels attacked the airship before we took off and took a bunch of us captive. You know, the, the three of them were brainwashed. I managed to escape, but... Sue cuts her off and says, brainwashed, do you expect me to believe that? And Kuvira's like, I'm telling the truth. So that's like the second time in the book we've had Kuvira not being believed by someone that she wants them to believe her on. Uh, even though like we as the audience know she is sort of telling the truth and being honest. But, you know, that's her history kind of going against her here. Um, and I suppose that also links into her backstory as well. Like her parents didn't believe her and is this part of her behavior or was she always blamed for stuff she didn't do that's the, that's the question uh so she explains Cora and king Wu are off trying to find your mother and i'm out here all alone i know you have every reason to hate me but i didn't know who else to turn to please i need your help so that's how we end this you know pretty much one of our first you know this talks between sue and kuvira this is very much just catching everyone up still showing the distrust between them. This isn't the the big conversation we were uh, going for, but it's at least on um, Kavira's side of things, like opening up the door to communication a little bit that we'll hopefully get into in part three. But uh, what are your thoughts on this radio call? Yeah, no, I agree. This definitely is sort of the beginning of them sort of having talks. I mean, just the fact that, you know, anyone's even open to even sort of like attempt to sort of listen to her um especially with sue with you know the history that they apparently have um i think that's definitely the way to go about sort of beginning those conversations i mean we don't really see you know anything more of that in this book um then i don't have to be in the next book but no i just think it's a good way to start okay so um next up uh we have um cora toff and Wu on naga arriving in gaoling and they see Lots of brainwashed people out here with posters of Guan saying, go with Guan, um, saying that a vote for him is a vote for progress and prosperity. And they're like questioning like, wow, where did all this support come from? Um, and, you know, they're like, they sound really enthusiastic and stuff like that. So uh, some of the guards notice the core is back in town. So they go off to alert Guan. We then cut into the... Um, office uh, i don't know what specific office you call it but um we have toff officially uh, becoming a candidate uh, for the uh, governorship of uh Gao Ling. and we get like and paragraph 5 subsection h stipulates that in the event of a force majeure the election will be suspended until such time as enough flim flammery where do i sign um actually reading that again i is i'm going to assume that that 
subsection might actually be like used in all of this um so it, it's not just like a bunch of like legalese basically that's actually quite interesting I, I i pretty much skipped over that line of dialogue until just reading it here so that's interesting to consider but uh anyway she signs up uh, and she asks give it to me straight mr mayor what do you think my chances are if you'd asked me yesterday, I would have said you'd win easily. But practically overnight, there's been an unexpected groundswell of support for Guan. You don't say. So, uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on uh, these two pages? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's the point that you make about the whole sort of like legalese part, I think is definitely something that's going to come into play just because of how everything ends in the book. Um, but, you know, it's, it's classic tough to sort of, you know, cover over that part there. So it definitely, you know, works with what they're going to say here. Um, but no, I, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting just to see, you know, how quickly he can work with the brainwashing and, you know, how that sort of, you know, putting everyone or making it seem like they have this much sort of, like, support here. Um, so, I don't know, it's interesting. I wonder, you know, how do they scale up sort of the, the brainwashing so fast or if they just, you know, I mean, we saw that they already had, you know, a lot of people sort of working in progress for this. Um, so, no, I think it's definitely interesting to see how they're showing how strong his sort of, like, ability to sort of control people or just control i guess the province or the area mm -hmm. so uh after this uh they decide they're gonna head back to the airfield now to see what's going up with the sami and so on this is when pabu runs up to them and jumps into Korra's arms then we see kuvira in the car head to them uh of course Korra just thinks it's an earth empire soldier but then kuvira takes off the helmet uh, revealing it to be herself Korra freaks out and is like, where are Sami, Mako, and Bo Lin? Again, another situation, the third situation where Kuvira has to explain herself to someone who assumes that she's done something terrible or wrong. I'll explain everything, but we need to get off the road before someone spots us. Gwan's at the airfield waiting to ambush you, and Korra firebends at her. Pretty cool firebending move, actually. She should have uh, creates a ring of fire around Kuvira and like holds it there. I warned you if I, if you hurt my friends, I would take you down. I didn't harm them, I swear. So where are they, and why are you wearing that uniform? This is where Kavira has to explain herself again, uh, that the airship was attacked, uh, the, the other three were brainwashed, Korra says, don't lie to me, I'm not. Toph, tell her. And Toph is like, yeah, she's telling the truth. And this is where Korra's like, wait, she is? How do you know that? Um, and Kavira is the one to say, she's a truth seer. So uh, we'll cut it off there to, to discuss these few pages there. But uh, I do find it interesting that they finally, like, you know, give that term to Toph, that, like, her ability to sense if people are lying or not just through her sort of, like, seismic sense is also her being a truth seer, which was previously the term given to Ai Wei, I believe. Uh, and we thought that was just because of his sort of unique sort of, like, um, acupuncture stuff, that that's how he was doing it. But... Toph is considered the same, even if she uses slightly different techniques to get the, the point across. But uh, still, I, I like this scene of just Kuvira once again being shown that she still has a lot of work to do to get people to trust her. And so when someone does put their trust in her, it's going to be a pretty big thing. But uh, what, what are your thoughts on these couple of pages here? Yeah, no, I mean, the whole idea of trust with Kuvira is obviously just a main point of just, you know, her character in general and having this sort of have some way to sort of build it back up like i mean i you know i doubt that you know everyone's going to be super happy with her even by the end of you know the next book but you know maybe people will see some sort of idea you know of her being you know slightly more reasonable at least you know with her saying that she'll do whatever she says that she's going to do even if that is sort of like the wrong thing as well um but no i think it's definitely a cool sequence here the whole idea like you mentioned about the fire sort of ring you know being held in front of her i think it's definitely a cool way of seeing you know core use that sort of ability and yeah i think it's it's definitely cool that you know i guess you know it's probably just something from the metal clan in general just you know with people being able to somehow be able to sort of tell the truth through some form of earth bending that's sort of like an official term that they have um just in general and you know of course toth being able to do that from you know the original series um you know just sort of has that sort of designation that and just her you know her character in general being wise and stuff would probably be able to see a lot of this stuff regardless um but no i think it's definitely a cool sequence here mm-hmm 
Uh, next up, we get Hop saying, uh, I knew there was something fishy, I had one supporter kept mindlessly repeating the same slogan over and over. It's like Long Fang all over again. Cora says, who? And this is where Wu actually speaks up, of course, he, he'd know who Long Fang is with the history. Long Fang served Earth King Kuei, my great-great-grandfather. He and the Dai Li manipulated um, the king so they could control bossing Sei. Long Fang brainwashed anyone he saw as a threat. You know your history, kid. Just be glad you didn't live through it. This brainwashing business is no joke. So, Asa so Mako, Bolin, and Sami, their minds are no longer their own. Um, so, uh, what are your thoughts on this page? The really clear uh, reference once again in this book to the Daily, specifically Long Fang this time. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely a really cool callback. I don't know, I can't think of another time where we've had a callback like that far that was really sort of interesting like that. Um, but no, I think the whole idea of that sort of being the history and Toph, of course, actually being there and seeing, you know, how to brainwash people actually sort of worked. Um, I think that was definitely a cool thing, if you can remember that from back in the day. Mm -hmm. And a line that really stood out to me here was uh, definitely... Um, Quay, uh, sorry, Wu referring to Quay as his great great grandfather. I just like when I read this book for the first time, I just kind of sat there for like a minute or two, just thinking about that. Like, does that make sense? Um, because like I'd always again considered the fact that like, he calls Hu Ting his aunt, but if you actually look into it, it's actually that like she's his like great aunt uh, actually. So that sort of confused things. I think it roughly works out, but it is definitely confusing since we don't have, like, all the different family lines. I think what makes it super confusing is that, um, you know, Quay is uh, the 52nd Earth King, and then Hu Ting is actually the the 53rd. So there's actually, there's no in-betweens between the two of them. Um, yet Wu is talking about, like, just the previous king as being, like, great great grandfather like so many generations so um i would like to know the the specifics here i think the fact that they went as far as to specifically say that and be so specific gives me the impression they probably know like at least the the, the idea of the family tree I'd, I'd like to see what that actually looks like uh, did, did you um th think about that at all reading that <laughs> i don't know i mean i think i wondered just sort of how the tree works in general just as far as like lineage because that's something that we seem to get every once in a while as far as like you know how the descendants pass down um but other than that i mean i don't know it's i don't know how you know his calling you know hutang sort of like auntie i don't know if that's like you know direct odd or like you know aunt aunt or whatever something like that i wouldn't be surprised if it's not sort of like directly in line in that sort of way the way that sort of the dynasties sort of go Mm, yeah and then like it is confusing as well with the idea that like they never in book four like when they introduced Wu they never even like went into that much detail that like explaining like where are the other like descendants the others uh, next in line like how, why is it him and not like someone else like is it is, is did a bunch of people die in, in this and stuff like that like of course from like Kyoshi and stuff like that we know that like that book talked about like three or four different like earth kings being like assassinated it, it, it mentioned like a few things like that that they, they went through a bunch of kings so uh, we just happen to be in an era where we are not getting too many different kings and queens but um interesting anyway uh next we move on to a single page showing the uh, um brainwashed mako asami and bolin fully under commands uh, orders here uh, we see that they're now in Earth Empire outfits, and um, he says, I thought you said Kor was going to meet you back here this afternoon. That was the plan, Commander. Well, where is she? This is where they he gets the information from his troops back in town. The Avatar passed through town. She was on her way to the airfield, but Kuvira showed up and intercepted her. Where are they now? And he knows where they are. So um, this is pretty much just a page just catching everyone up, and I think mainly to show that, you know, he now has, you know, the rest of Team Avatar as his, like, main soldiers now. I think that's that's the main thing to take away from this page. Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on this page? 
Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, they're probably the best benders that he has in his sort of forces. Um, so it makes sense that they would be up there in the front, even if they are brainwashed. Mm-hmm. We cut back to uh, Wu, Kavira, Toph, and Korra. Wu is freaking out. This is the disaster. Guan's going to steal the election and brainwash the entire kingdom in the process. No, no, no. This is all my fault. I ne- never should have asked you all to come. Kuvira speaks up and says, it's pointless to blame yourself, you couldn't have known this was going to happen. Wait, I know a way I can put a stop to all of this and make things right again. How? By calling off the election. Toph speaks up and says, great idea, I didn't want to run in the first place. Are you sure this is the best strategy? It's perfect, Guan can't steal the election if there isn't one. And Kuvira says, he makes a good point. Thank you Kuvira, now if you'll excuse me, as he's about to basically walk off into town to like announce the elections called off and Kuvira has to be the one to sort of bring him down to earth um, and get him up to speed with what's going on. Where do you think you're going? Back to City Hall, I need to issue my decree to the mayor. Bad idea, once Guan gets wind of what you're up to, none of us are getting out of Gaoling, not with our minds intact anyway. Then what do you suggest we do? Asami Mok and Bolin are still in danger. We can regroup in Zaofu and get some reinforcements there. And this is where uh, Kavira points out that uh, Sue is on the way. Her airship is just about to land. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll cover the, the next bit of that page in a minute. So this is the big thing about the development with Wu is that he he's going to call off the elections here. It seems like in this case, primarily just to counter the threat of Guan rather than because of like the visions and stuff like that so he's calling them off not to step up as a leader and do what the the queen suggested he do but just to you know stop the villain from doing what the villain is planning to do and there seems to be some agreement that this is at least a solid enough plan and i definitely really want to know where they go with this in part three but it's uh it's interesting that he he gets as far as to you know commit to calling off the thing he called in the first place but uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, decision here by Wu? i mean it seems like he's you know he seems like he's behind it for like you know the right reason even if it isn't really sort of like a solution to the problem that they actually have um so you know at least he's not you know he didn't sort of like stay in the ball on the ground which was sort of like his initial reaction so you know i think that is some sort of progress and he you know he gets some feedback for his idea i think you know they're probably gonna you know like we mentioned before use some claws or something to sort of get things to sort of work in their way because you know it definitely seems and from what everything that we know that you know going forward with elections in some form or fashion will probably be you know sort of the end result um but it's just sort of like how do they get there with the current sort of chaos that is going on Mm -hmm. so uh before sue lands we do get a cut to the airship just before it lands um opal speaking to her mother i still don't understand why you didn't send the metal clan soldiers to collect kuvira it's important that i bring her in myself after everything kuvira has done to our family all the anguish she's put us through how can you still have a soft spot for her mom? This isn't the time, Opal. Pilot, bring us down. Uh, I, I like this as an interesting one because, like, Opal back in book four was one of the people who was most against Kuvira. Like, back when like Kuvira was first being sort of introduced to us, Opal was the most like aggressively sort of anti-Kuvira, um, and we see that it's Opal calling out her mother, who we always think like Sue is very harsh, but like the Kuvira despite being like an adopted daughter apparently but it's interesting that Opal thinks Sue is giving like Kuvira too much leeway in all of this showing us that there is that soft spot there from Sue towards Kuvira despite outwardly her maybe not showing it as much but that you know the door of communication is actually sort of open both ways now we're just waiting to have this big conversation reveal how was their rela- dynamic together growing up and stuff like that um i i just thought this was an interesting use of opal here and the role she played in book four to just set up the the things on sue's side but uh what are your thoughts on that these couple of panels yeah no i mean opal's always been sort of like the strongest sort of critic against Kavira for you know various sort of reasons here and you know just seeing opal act you know more, you know, on the aggressive sort of side here of sort of questioning her own mother where 
you know, in the past we haven't really seen her do that as much. You know, definitely shows some growth in her character as well. But yeah, no, I mean, it definitely seems like both sides of this sort of, you know, conflict here are at least, you know, beginning to be open or at least reflecting on sort of past things that may have, may have not gone the way that they thought of in order to sort of have some possible resolution in the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, the airship lands, the ramp comes down, Sue says, hello, Kuvira. Kuvira responds and says, I appreciate you coming. Toph interrupts everyone as they sort of have the quick sort of meet and greets. Um, so... It's uh, basically Wei, Wing, and Opal uh, happy to see their grandmother here, and she's happy to see them. N nice scene to see, as Sue and Kuvira just sort of walk straight past each other. You do, in the art, get enough detail to see that sort of Su Yin kind of glances at uh, Kuvira as she walks by. So, you know, they're they're definitely laying the groundwork that like there's going to be some sort of a, a big conversation that happens. But she goes, Korra, what are you waiting for? That they're planning to go back to Zhao Fu. But this is where Korra decides that, no, you go. I'm not leaving without Asami, Maku, and Bolin. She walks down the ramp herself as the army of Guan comes in. Uh, Kubira says, Dr. Shang used some kind of magnetic technology to intensify the effect of the brainwashing. I don't know how to reverse it, but if we go back to Zhao Fu, then maybe... And Korra cuts her off and says, I'm not going to abandon my friends to that madman. Kavira just responds, understood, then I'll help you get them back. Thank you. We'll help too, so everyone has decided to rally behind Korra here. They're not just going to leave, they're going to have a fight here. So, um, Toph just warns Wu, you stay here, Spindle Shanks, um, it's going to get ugly as the battle is preparing to happen here. So uh, some interesting stuff here of like just uh, character interactions, character sort of non-interactions, and then you, you definitely get the impression Kuvira really sort of understands Korra. That, that was made clear in part one and now here. The loyalty on both sides with that group of Korra for her friends and then her friends for Korra. And she's willing to just on her own, no one has to tell her to help Korra. She just says it on her own, she's going to help. And... It is interesting that, you know, the first person to back Korra up with the fight is Kuvira. So, um, I do like that. Um, but what are your thoughts on the, the setup for the battle here? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, we've mentioned before how, you know, Kuvira is here, you know, on the request of the Avatar. Or, you know, despite sort of everything that's happened in the past, it seems like, you know, whatever has happened that, you know, they are starting to have, you know, some sort of understanding, even if it isn't real, sort of like, you know, there's no real sort of like truth or whatever, but, you know, it's just sort of like a basic level of understanding here um, that Kuvira has for Korra and just, you know, the idea of not leaving her friends behind, even though, you know, she doesn't really know how to solve any of the situations. Um, you know, I think that comes across pretty clear here. Mm -hmm. uh, Guan gives his orders to his troops uh, Mako, Bolin, and Asami uh, The Avatar's your enemy, bring her to me They get up Mako gets a fire dagger ready Asami readies her shot glove And Bolin has a lava shuriken So uh, very powerful attacks ready to go And he just sits back and says This should be fun to watch We see Opal call out Bolin, it's me, please stop Korra says Asami, you can fight this and Kuvira just knows it's pointless to try and reason with them. And Korra gives the orders before battle here. We'll have to play defense. Um, Toph says, I can take them out, no problem. And Opal's like, no, Grandma, no, we don't want to hurt them. Um, uh, Korra says, Sue, Wei, Wing, and Opal, uh, uh, and I will steer them towards you, wrap them up with cables, and get them on the ship. That's the plan. And... Um, Toph and Kuvira are going to be ready if uh, Guan and his soldiers make a move. So uh, this is the battle about to begin here. Uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, preparation here for battle here, seeing, uh, <laughs> the, seeing the, rest, the team avatar square up against the, the, everyone else? Yeah, no, I think, you know, the way that they have the idea, you know, they try to get through to him, which is a classic thing, but, you know, the brainwashing is pretty strong. I like that, you know, Toph jumps out about not really sort of being involved in sort of the initial plan, but it's still there to sort of, you know, 
help if things sort of get out of hand, um, which, you know, kind of makes sense with them just being able to, you know, cause sort of like a massive amount of damage. I mean, you know, pretty much a lot of them, depending on, you know, the bending moves that they use could, you know, take out any of them depending on how much damage that they want to cause. But, you know, they they still are their friends, so they don't want to cause that much damage, even though Toph seems to have less of an issue with that per se. Mm-hmm. So the battle begins, uh, everyone dodges um, the brainwashed Team Avatar's moves, and then Korra and Opal do their move together where they sort of airbend Team Avatar from the side. It knocks them all together. Then Su, Wei, and Wing bind them up with the metal ropes. Um, but Guan uses his, his metal bending to snap them, freeing um, everyone. Uh, he orders the rest of his troops to move in, and... Um, this is where I think the the battle gets a little bit messy. It's a fairly simple battlefield, but they just have like, you know, Toph warning Wu to stay on board the ship. So getting across the idea that like they're protecting him in the middle of this battle, and then all of a sudden we just see Kavira, Sue, and Toph all just completely run off in the other direction of the ramp to uh, earthbend some soldiers, and we just get some soldiers sort of walking on board to capture Wu. But uh, in between that happening, we do have Bolin getting some earth bending going and he squares off against Opal. He fires some rocks at her. She dodges one but gets hit pretty bad in the shoulder with one of the other ones and she goes down. Uh, Opal's brothers, Wei and Wing, notice this and they go to help her. But it's the it's the idea that Bolin has actually hurt Opal here, and that's a, a pretty big thing to happen. So uh, so far in the fight, uh, what what are your thoughts on the, the opening section? Um, yeah, I mean it definitely, you know, ramps up pretty quickly here I'm um, just sort of them sort of trying to capture them but you know not quite being able to get it fully here and I don't know I think it's cool to see you know the three sort of earthbenders sort of work together to create you know sort of the massive sort of you know you no know, groundswell to sort of knock all the other sort of forces that are sort of coming because you know it is pretty much Guan has like sort of like a mini army here to sort of you know take them all back in here but you know with you know Sue, Toph, and sort of Kavira, that's a pretty sort of, you know, large amount of power. I mean, I don't know, maybe Toph or any one of them could have done that sort of move by themselves, but no, it's always cool to see it done in a group, and it does, you know, make it more sort of impactful. Um, I don't know, it doesn't seem to me like they were really sort of protecting Wu in that sort of direct sort of fashion, that they were more sort of like on standby for the fight so but no i think it it definitely is interesting when opal does get hit with um bolin i think that definitely seemed like a pretty strong hit like sort of like a dislocated shoulder or a broken shoulder type of hit there so it'll be interesting to see how that's sort of taken later on for sure Mm -hmm. so uh yeah with with the with the rampway cleared the soldiers just walk on board and take Wu away um no one seems to notice this until the end of the battle which i i think is probably like the the weirdest thing about it in that like a few panels later uh you have like kuvira sue and toff like with a with a barricade like directly in front of the ramp and it's like how 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 did the the soldiers get woo off like with them noticing this is where it gets just a little bit messy i think the other messy thing is in or around this section here with uh, Korra and asami so they end up squaring off on the battlefield of course Korra doesn't want to fight Asami at all but she does have to dodge the uh, shock glove attacks she's like Asami no I hope you'll forgive me for this as she earth bends Asami's kind of uh, feet to keep her in place and then um, earth bends her um, shock glove into the ground and she just sort of leaves her there and there's no explanation given for like how Asami is taken from here on board the ship other than like a few panels later we just see like Kuvira bringing Asami on board so I, I think there's a few little like messy unexplained parts of the fight and that like Kuvira is like behind the barricade like right, right up at the ramp and Korra is like way off ahead yet they like change places almost it's a it's a bit messy um but we have uh everyone firebending against the giant earth rampart that uh, the earthbenders have made Mako gives the order, bring down that wall to his brother, and Bolin just effortlessly brings down a wall made by, like, three master earthbenders, so that was a pretty cool move. Korra then blocks everything as everyone has to retreat here, and they're going to have to accept that 
they only got a Sami back, but they lost Wu in the process. So they just have to accept it because they're completely outnumbered as they take off. So what are your thoughts on the uh, second section of this fight? Yeah, no, I think this is interesting. I mean, your mention of sort of the layout of things is kind of interesting because they don't, I think there's some sort of like in between sort of scenes that we don't quite sort of see. Um, I don't know, it seems like there are certain fights that are often on the side versus ones that are in front because, I mean, you do see for a little bit, you know, um, them sort of take woo um, away from them while Cora sort of blocking the fire, but it's not quite clear how they got around sort of like Kavira. It seems like they almost like go off to the side while, you know, the other fight's sort of still going on there or that they're sort of behind the the, I guess the earth wall until it sort of gets taken down so yeah no I definitely can see your point as far as you know where certain things are happening into in relation to each other I think it would have helped if they did you know like they show when they're escaping they show sort of like a top-down view of things and think that probably would have been helpful to have maybe one more of those earlier on in the scene because I mean it does seem like you know it's a battle things are going all over the place so you know for things to happen that you wouldn't necessarily notice during the heat of the battle doesn't really you know that part doesn't really throw me off you know so much it's just sort of where things are happening into relation to each other um you know can kind of seem a bit sort of odd hmm. yeah it's just weird because like you say they do in the middle of core defending show like Wu being escorted off that they have him they're also in the back of one of the panels show Wei and Wing uh, bringing Opal on board as well and like those sort of make sense in that like okay Opal was over there they just kind of diagonally brought her across but I think the Asami thing is definitely the weirdest one because like Korra at the start of the battle goes off to the left because they specifically note that like Opal goes right she air bends from the right Korra from the left the during the opening section so that's where Korra and Asami are fighting uh, then like the next time we see Kuvira she's standing to like Korra's right but yet like a panel later she's apparently gone like behind Korra over to where Asami was left in the ground and taken her away it's just um it, it, it there needed to be a an intermediate kind of panel to show some of this stuff but um Anyway, we move on and we're back on board the airship and we get Korra talking to Asami who... Asami is now the one in Kuvira's metal prison. I'm sorry I have to do this, Asami, and I'm sorry about what Guan did to you. Don't pretend you care about me, is Asami's response. You're the enemy. Korra is shocked to hear this coming out of Asami's mouth. Uh, you don't know what you're saying, Asami. You don't mean it. Those are Guan's words, not yours. And she... Uh, goes to leave knowing that she's just gonna have to if she if she sticks around she's just gonna basically just witness asami just saying stuff that's meant to hurt her that is not actually asami so she unfortunately has to leave so um it's an interesting one in that like obviously core asami is a big kind of focus in all of this and it, it definitely you know gets across you know the the impact here that like Korra seeing asami like this is kind of terrible because right now they don't know if there is a solution to undo the brainwashing. So what if Asami is like this forever? That relationship is done. Um, and like there is, there's some impact to the idea of like, you know, Asami just saying these things, even if it, they know it's because of the brainwashing. And th this is kind of, you know, just gets into like the potential strengths plus weaknesses of just a brainwashing plot in general in that, one, it doesn't really allow you to to develop those characters while they're um, brainwashed. And in Asami's case especially, it's a bit unfortunate that they had to brainwash her because she's probably the character in most need of development. And it doesn't obviously seem like there's immediately that many sort of development paths, even once you kind of cl clear up Asami of the brainwashing. Uh, in that, I think reflecting on this book... I actually think this book probably would have been interesting if they had Korra get brainwashed and the rest of the crew be the ones who had to try and get Korra back. That way you're developing the members of Team Avatar who need development versus Korra who doesn't matter if like Korra is sort of out of action brainwashed for a part or two. She's already had like so much development and she's able to sort of be sort of the, the, the one person army on her own and it'd be cool to see 
you know, Bako Bolin and Asami in their right minds trying to get her back. Um, and then you see the team who doesn't trust Kuvira have to team up with Kuvira to get Korra back. I think that would have worked a little bit better rather than like Asami needs development, but we're brainwashing Asami and we're trying to give Korra more development when she maybe doesn't need it. But um, what are your thoughts on this uh, scene here with uh, Korra and Asami? And I suppose just your, your general thoughts on the brainwashing plot in the, in the book as well. Hmm. You know, that that is an interesting point. If they were to sort of flip the roles, how would that sort of work? I mean, I don't know. I think that might have been a bit too hard to work with just sort of, you know, with you no know, core being the avatar and having that sort of in the wrong hands or I guess sort of having, you know, sort of like a dark avatar or evil avatar, which I guess we sort of have sort of seen before. Um, so I don't know. That seems like it would be interesting just because we would have all of our sort of like, you know, secondary sort of ish characters sort of interacting with each other. So we would definitely get a lot more of their thoughts in general. Um, but I don't know how much that would sort of really sort of develop them overall sort of independent of Korra. Um, but I don't know. I think the idea of the whole sort of brainwashing thing, I guess is sort of, I don't know. It seems like it's going to be one of those things where this sort of force people to come to sort of realize sort of the issues that they've been having in the past and just sort of, you know, bring them all sort of, you know, together, which I guess it's going to be done regardless of who knows actually being done to the brainwashing. I guess it's really just a question of how much time they sort of have to resolve that sort of, you know, conflict point afterwards. I mean, because they have to, you know, they have to figure out how to sort of like reverse engineer this and, you know, have some time for them to actually have, you know, any sort of conversations with each other. Um, so I know that's the part where it seems like there wouldn't be sort of as much time for me to sort of have things happen. But, you know, from what we see here, you definitely can see sort of the, the pain that is causing, you know, sort of Korra right here with just sort of everything that's going on with sort of Asami. So, you know, I think, you know, the point of sort of, I guess, sort of maybe forcing their relationship forward, I think that's going to happen regardless of who's sort of being brainwashed. Mm. Yeah, like, uh, I think the problem for me is just, like, say, like, Bo Lin, when he gets unbrainwashed. Like, it, it, it's a it's a difficult situation because, like, you can't blame Bo Lin for hurting Opal because he was brainwashed. And so you're obviously going to have Bo Lin in a situation wanting to apologize to Opal, but, like, it's because he got brainwashed uh, is, is the answer to everything. And, like, does it change how Opal feels about Bo Lin? That would be a, a bit of a harsh kind of plot point to go down again, given that he was brainwashed. With Korra and Asami, once Asami's not brainwashed anymore, it's like Asami apologizes for saying these things. Um, like, it, it, it's just that, like, y the development is coming from the characters who aren't brainwashed, so I just think it would be a better position to have, like, Mako interact with Kuvira, Bolin interact with Kuvira, Asami interact with Kuvira, and, Asam and Korra, who doesn't need the development, um, is the one who gets brainwashed. And then, you know, th th that creates a an interesting situation where you have the characters who need more development get a chance to shine. Like, especially, especially Asami and Mako are probably the ones who need the most in the comics right now. Uh, Bolin has his arc. We'll see where they go with that in the end. But um, either way, um, we'll move on. Uh, only a few pages left. Um, and, uh, yeah. So we see, uh, see uh, Kuvira sitting alone on the airship. Wei and Wing ask, you want us to restrain Kuvira too? Suja says, no, leave her. Leave her be. She's not a flight risk. Uh, and one of them says, uh, I hope you're right, mom. Also in the background of the scene, it's a pretty nice moment. We see um, Opal kind of resting on uh, Toph's lap, which is interesting in context in that this was one of the pages I was able to see from... Um, the Google Books preview pages, but I didn't have any context to the fact that Opal actually got injured in one of the previous ones. So I thought it was just like, as they escaped, it was just, you know, a nice moment between Opal and Toph. But actually knowing that like Opal got hurt, it's like, oh, that's a, a different context to, to what's happening there. But still a nice moment there of Toph looking after her. And then uh, Korra comes over to Kavira and says, you were saying earlier that there might be a way to counter the brainwashing, right? Please tell me uh, it'll work on Asami. Kuvira says, I got a good look at Dr. Shang's setup. I'm sure there's a way to reverse engineer it, but I won't be able to figure it out alone. 
I'm going to need Batar Jr.'s help. So this is a moment, again, I think we were all waiting for in this book, is that, like, Kura's main issues are with Sue, but you also probably want to include Batar Jr. in there as well to confirm some of that. So part three, more than likely, we're going to get introduced to Batar Jr. again, see where he's at, see what their relationship is like, and he'll be the key to reversing the, the Dr. Shang stuff. So I think that is ultimately like the, the perfect way to use Batar. Uh, I just hope they, they give him time for development as well to see where, where he's at and it's not just all on Kuvira. But uh, what are your thoughts on uh, this page? Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see how they all have to sort of interact with each other after everything that sort of happened here. I mean, just the fact that, you know, she has, you know, she seems like she has, you know, some idea of how to sort of reverse this thing, but, you know, she's going to need, you know, someone with more sort of technical sort of prowess than what she sort of has. And, you know, the only other person for that is another person that she's wronged pretty badly in the past here. So, you know, of course, they're going to sort of have to get them all together. I mean, definitely seems like we're moving in a direction of where there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to have to happen in the next book. Um, that should be pretty cool to see if they can do it in the right way. Mm -hmm. Last page uh, is uh, prepare the subject, and we see Wu this time is put in the brainwashing seat. Mako and Bolin again, you know, still brainwashed, standing behind him. You may begin, Doctor, as the brainwashing of Wu begins. So that's the cliffhanger ending, and and it is an interesting one in that like the the brainwashing was like the, the ending to part one pretty much, and here's the again the brainwashing to part two. This time, it has the effect of, like, Wu is the one with the power to cancel the elections. Now, he's going to be brainwashed, and all of a sudden, Guan is going to have, like, the ultimate supporter. If the guy who called for the elections is going to vote for Guan, uh, that, that means he's going to win for sure. And plus, there's no way to stop the elections. Except, as, as we found out going through it here... There's that, uh, you know, subsection 8 about the force majeure thing. So basically if something huge happens, you can cancel it. So um, we'll see how they get to that point. Like, will Toph be the one to bring it up and be like, oh, there was just a battle outside the town not that long ago, so we can't have it or or something like that. Um, it, it's, it's one of those ones where, like, I don't think it's the biggest cliffhanger ending we've ever had before and that you have to think a little bit about, about what, what exactly it means. How does this specifically change things? But um, it's 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 nice enough to see just like Wu, who's been going through a little bit of development, is now going to get brainwashed, and we have to see how he comes out of it and what decision he makes once he is unbrainwashed. So, what are your thoughts on this as the the ending to part two? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely pretty impactful, just because you know you are going to have Wu sort of be brainwashed, and you know he, in theory, can enact certain things, or you know he could just become you know full on sort of puppet if they didn't want to sort of go with the whole sort of democracy sort of route that you know he was already trying to push here. So no, it'll be interesting to see how this works out. I think it'll be, and I'm curious to see how. Wu acts as like sort of like a brainwashed sort of person. Will he still be like sort of quirky but still following Guan's rules or with like completely sort of monotone? Um, so I think that's going to see for as a, a character perspective. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I don't know. I guess because of his character, it doesn't seem, you know, he has a lot of power. I mean, he is sort of the current sort of king, but just him as a character himself, it doesn't seem like the most sort of like intimidating thing that you would ever sort of think of when you think of someone being sort of brainwashed, but that's just sort of, you know, how we sort of currently view him but you know it definitely seems like a pretty dire situation to be in regardless mm -hmm. and uh yeah that, that was the final page of the book at uh, the end of part two so we're two-thirds of the way through the book and part three definitely leaves a lot to kind of uh, go on for <clears throat> sure and uh, just looking at the the cover for part three is pretty interesting now because and um, before we had part two like the, the part three cover was like what revealed to us the whole oh team avatar gets brainwashed but now that we have part two, it suddenly is like, wait, you know, as, uh, they have Asami. So Asami is not going to be with Mako and Bolin brainwashed for the rest of the book uh, in part three. So does she escape somehow um, and get back to them? Or is that just one of those things where to not spoil the events of part two, they had to include her there? Um, or, or what? Is it an interesting one? 
Plus the fact that on the cover, for in the back of the cover, we also have Zhao Fu getting across the idea that that's going to be the focus. Like, we know that's where they're heading. That's where they're going to go on the airship is, you know, bringing Kuvira back to Zhao Fu uh, to, uh, you know, you know, organize things before they plan what they have to do next, uh, which makes it feel like, are we just going to, like, go into part three and it's like, Guan won the election in Gaoling, that, like, we just have to sort of abandon that now because we, we lost, basically. Uh, so, I suppose just based off the cover, you know, what are your immediate thoughts on part three and where we're heading? Yeah, no, I think that is interesting, the fact that, you no. Know, I don't know, is it because she's still brainwashed? I mean, I guess it's, she is still brainwashed, so it's not like she's really on, you know, the good side of things. She still has to sort of be deprogrammed and everything else like that. So, you know, in that sense, I guess it kind of makes sense. And, you know, seeing Cor and Quivira, we see them, they are sort of working together, so that sort of makes sense. I mean, I don't know, I mean, you know, Guam's going to know that they're going to Zhao Fu, so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't, you know, do something there, although that seems like a pretty sort of, I guess, sort of like a bold move for him to sort of do, but, you know, I guess Zafu would be the current sort of base of operation for things that are going on, um, you know, just how that sort of works in the whole sort of, like, government scheme of things, I think, would be interesting overall, just, like, if there was something that Wu could do to sort of, you know, lay claim to the area that Zafu is in or something along those lines, so, I don't know, I think, you know, there definitely are a bunch of different routes that they can go through and just sort of, you know, that being the potential place where they do develop the technology to sort of reverse engineer this whole sort of brainwashing, um, I think is, you know, it's, it makes sense that that would be sort of, I guess, a main sort of location for the set. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of things that they have to wrap up and a lot of different sort of, you know, just resolution, character resolutions that have to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the description for part three is kind of interesting in a kind of post part two world in that, like, a lot of it doesn't quite make sense and feels like they're really holding back on stuff. I'll just read it out here. Kuvira's true nature is revealed, and the Earth Kingdom will feel the consequences. Thanks to Commander Guan and Dr. Shang's brainwashing technology, all hope for a fair election in the Earth Kingdom is lost. Korra works with Toph Su and Kuvira to plan a means to rescue not just the brainwashed Mako Bolin and Asami, but everyone else caught up in Guan's plan. With the Earth Empire possibly on the rise again, Kuvira pulls another trick from her sleeve, but whose side is she truly on? That's a very kind of unusual one in that I personally, from part one and part two, get no indication that like Kuvira is like plotting stuff and that were meant to sort of view like whose side is she on type stuff because like she had a chance to escape here but didn't so um unless they are really going to turn the biggest switch that they've ever done like in this uh, uh in the comics and and have kuvira go back to being a villain in part three as like a huge twist uh i don't really see it happening um I I don't like they could go that path I suppose like it would be a huge thing to do to just have Kavira once again go back to being a villain and she takes over things again but I really don't think that's the path we're going I think the development is all towards progress for Kavira and so the description for part three I think just doesn't really tell us much about the book because they're still saying that you know uh, rescue the brainwashed Asami even though they already have her no mention of Batar in this one, of course, because that's a bit of a spoiler. So, you know, it's 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 not the the most revealing description. And um, so, w what are your thoughts on that uh, with the description for part three? And um, is it just one of those really early ones for like a finale where they just don't say anything, or do you actually think there might be a chance that they do pull a big twist with Kavira? I don't know. I mean, from what we've seen so far, it doesn't seem like they would be pulling a big twist, but, you know, that makes you, the whole description of that definitely sort of makes you think different. I mean, I don't know, I could see them pulling a twist where, like, you know, they think that, you know, she can't be trusted again, but she does wind up being trustful again, but, you know, that still causes some sort of tension. I mean, I could see Kavir doing something like that just for, you know, the sake of her pride or just for the sake of, you know, her doing what she thinks is right in sort of the moment. Um, I don't know, I don't see her sort of go 
doing, you know, full 180 and switching back to sort of Guam side and like maybe sort of like supporting the brainwashing. That doesn't seem like the current character progression that we're seeing right now. Um, so I think, you know, some of it is just probably just sort of early sort of summary stuff. And there's still sort of more to it than we really sort of are led to believe. Mm hmm. So, yeah, like, like, immediately my assumption is that uh, we're going, I suppose, like, we don't really know where Batar is, like, is he back in Zhao Fu? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. So, they're going to get him in, I assume, fairly early on. I think that, that that makes the most sense, that they just, they teased him at the end of part two. They they can't wait, like, a huge amount of the book to bring him in towards the end, so... He ought to be brought in fairly early to so he can work on a solution to the brainwashing because I assume Asami will be the first one they cure because they have to use her as sort of a a test, you know, to see that they actually like accomplish it. Um so that will bring Asami back into play maybe a little bit earlier than we thought. Um and you know, I suppose if they do cure her, it kind of gives the option for like what if, like, they, they stage a breakout of Asami and Asami's, like, a double agent type thing and they, they do something, um, that's just me hoping that they do something a bit more with Asami, um, because with Asami, they're also going to have to do something with Kavira in that I think everyone is waiting for her to apologize to Asami for killing Hiroshi as, like, one of the unspoken things in the book of, like, uh, I, it was mentioned at the very start of part one, I think, Korra talking to Asami, um, but between Kuvira and Asami, it hasn't been brought up, and Asami is sort of meant to represent on Team Avatar the one who least trusts Kuvira because of that. So, uh, where Kuvira stands with Asami very much, I think, represents where we're meant to sort of view her as well. Um, uh, beyond that, it's it's difficult in that, like, okay, Batar, will how quickly will he be able to solve this problem? Might they bring Varric in somehow on this? Because it, they talked about, like, it's, like, magnetism and stuff like that. And that seems to sort of be, like, Varric's sort of speciality as, like, a scientist inventor. is like, the, the EMP style stuff. So, uh, because I don't think there's any way they can do the solution to the brainwashing where it's a specific thing where you have to have the person right in front of you. So... It'll probably have to be some sort of a anti-brainwashing type EMP thing, but uh, we'll see how they go about it. Um, do you have any uh, immediate speculation about where they're going to go, what characters they're going to use where? Um, yeah, no, that, that would be interesting if they do bring Varric back into it. I mean, I think, you know, that kind of sort of makes sense as another person who's more technically inclined, but I don't know. I mean, I think maybe they shouldn't just to sort of keep the focus on sort of the current characters that we have and certain resolutions. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, Kavira pretty much has a resolution to sort of make with pretty much everyone. Um, so, you know, I guess it wouldn't be too off to have, you know, more people in it, but it just, it seems like it would be a lot for them to sort of have to deal with. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the idea of how to actually do about the sort of brainwashing, if it's some sort of like EMP blast or if it's some sort of, I don't know, sort of one-on-one -on -one thing. I mean, I guess, you know, if he really has done that many people, then I guess this whole idea of it being more of a blast type thing would make more sense um, rather than it being sort of one-on-one. -on -one. But no, I don't know. I guess it really depends on how how crazy they can get with the tech and the amount of time that they have to develop it because, you know, it's not like they have a lot of time to do all this. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, with, with Kuvira and Batar Jr., um... It's, it's going to be very important to do this right in that I think the big question everyone has is just how does she view him in terms of like they technically like grew up together you know she was obviously sort of adopted into the family but then she started a relationship with him you know are we meant to view Kuvira during that time period as just thinking about the the project the plan and she only got together with Batar to get his loyalty uh, on her side so that she could use his skills to you know do what she did or does she actually care about him was there actual you know did she was she actively involved in that relationship or was it completely one-sided on on his side towards her and then how does he view her now like they had the whole thing with Kavira's Gambit episode 11 I think it was of book four where 
she specifically chose, you know, her plan over him. But you got the sense that it was a tough decision for her, but she still made that decision and nearly killed him. And um, so, I, I think it's going to be a big, big one about what they do with this. Like, given that they're leaning towards redemption for her, I assume it's going to have to be positive in some way how this happens. Um, but there's a lot of stuff to do with Kavira and like almost every character. I really, it's like. I think Korra and Kavira is like I think Korra already gets Kavira is on the right path. I think like Korra is the person that like Kavira least needs to prove herself to in a way, but um everyone else it's it's, it's right open, but um what direction do you think they'll take with Kavira and Batar and their potential relationship and so on? Yeah, I know. That's that's definitely a hard one cuz you never really understood the true depth of their sort of relationship like you can see there's something there but you can't really see what it sort of fully sort of you know encompasses so i don't know i'm curious to see how that actually sort of works out i think you know whatever you know while they're sort of working together to make this machine or whatever i think that would probably be sort of where we would obviously get the sort of you know resolution if any or some sort of understanding there um but you know i think it's going to take a lot more than just you know one or two conversations to really sort of bring things to close yeah and this is where like kuvira is definitely going to sort of be a project for the comics as, as the core comics progress like we're not going to get everything on kuvira in just this part three but i think we're expecting a statement about where her character is going and a lot of that i think is going to come down to the fact that the reason Kavira is able to be free in all of this and be involved in this plot line is because she's sort of been given a temporary, like, um, she's been sort of released into, like, Korra's custody, effectively, to help them deal with this threat, which she's specifically suited for because she's former Empire, Earth Empire leader and they're dealing with the, the new Earth Empire leader. So we're going to have to get back to the point where Kavira is on trial. That That's what we're going to come back to and we're going to see if, you know she accepts if she if they ask her to like plead again and what does she say um and then what is her punishment because i i they can't i I don't think just be like yes you're sentenced to life in prison we'll never see you again and she's just another zaheer out there in prison they have to give her some sort of a punishment where she's still able to sort of be active as a character i think um just because it it feels you know (laughs) Like, we, we can't just have every villain who is an interesting character be the new Ozai, where he just sits in prison and someone comes to speak to him every so often. Uh, we've done that twice with Ozai and Ozai here. I don't think you can do that with uh, Kuvira. So the biggest thing that they have to do is just decide where does she stand. And probably it is, like, doing something like releasing her into, like, Su Yin's custody so she, like, lives in Zhao Fu, but, like, she's under watch for a certain amount of time and it, it gets into the whole idea of like she's su- she's such a capable character that she can be used to help and it would be a waste to just have her just waste away in prison so why not use her while she's willing to help but uh where do you think they'll go on that like going back to where runes of the empire st- started and how they'll come back to it with the trial yeah, no, that's that's a good point. I mean, she is, you know, obviously a very sort of capable character, um, you know, that has a whole, you know, skill set that could benefit, you know, any any sort of area of the nation, really, um, that, I don't know, I mean, I don't know, I guess it really depends on how she reacts to, you know, being back on trial and the sort of, you know, crimes that she sort of committed and how... You know, the council or whoever is sort of judging her deems her actions or her, you know, supposed sort of redemption to sort of be, I mean, you know, I guess if, you know, she somehow comes out of this as being sort of like the main person that sort of helps, you know, quell this sort of uprising, then maybe they'll give her some more leniency or if not so, maybe if she does do this sort of like 180 thing, but still gets sort of captured and, you know, they could just sort of lock her sort of away. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess it really, you know, with her being such an interesting character, it would be sort of like, 
a shame not to see her involved in some sort of way in the future but you know, i guess it really depends on sort of like her threat risk really i mean if she's really that much of sort of like an issue um which i don't know it doesn't seem like she has as much sort of like support as she once sort of had um then you know they really could just sort of you know throw her away and sort of lock the key yeah, I I can maybe see the way they go about it is that they sort of almost like repeat the scene from part one where the, the judge just reads out all the stuff that she's accused of. You did this, 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 and this. And in part one, they sort of pointed out the idea that like Kuvira is unwilling to sort of go down for everything. She's she's She accepts that she did some stuff that was wrong, but she, she doesn't want to be sort of just you know blame for everything like the entire thing hinges solely upon her and she did nothing that she did was like a positive overall so i can see them sort of reading out those things again but this time like she actually has maybe like backup from people like cora maybe speaks up and says that like i think it should be you know brought into account that the Earth Kingdom is only, like, stable where it is now because of what she did. Uh, maybe Su Yin speaks up and says something else. Uh, Asami says something. And they just... They present enough sort of, like, she did this, and wh- while she did this thing that was wrong, this thing was good. And, like, they maybe remove some of the charges or something like that. So it goes from being, like, life in prison to, like, you know, some sort of thing where, like she's just in like constant like protective custody or something like that like she sort of is right now um and that's the way to sort of keep her active as a character um and that way you also do the thing where like she's gained the trust of other characters which is like the the character arc um beyond that i don't know how they do it without sort of frustrating people with you know why wasn't she punished for what she did type thing which she does you know she is guilty of some of that stuff so that that's that's the the, the confusing thing um uh, i don't know do, do, do you think they could do something like that in the trial just have like some of the characters here like kakora or asu sort of speak out on behalf of kuvira to get some of the charges put down maybe or something like that um i mean i could see that happening regardless i'm not sure how much that'll work as far as like her you know, getting some more sort of leniency. I mean, I'm sure, you know, anything that Avatar says, I guess, is generally considered in the world just because of the position that they have. And I guess, you know, the stronger the person who was sort of, like, originally against her, the more that they could, you know, speak for her would seem, you know, like, a positive thing in that sort of light. I don't know, you know, how they're going to sort of, like, bring people up to the trial, bring people up to the stand or anything sort of like that, like you see in sort of, like, a traditional sort of, like, you know, court case or anything like that. Um, So, I don't know. I think it's really... I don't know. I think it's also going to depend a lot on sort of, like, what she says or what, you know, what sort of revelations that she has from going through this whole sort of ordeal. Because, I mean, this seems like this is, like, you know, her time to sort of reflect on everything that she's, you know, had to do, you know, just as far as sort of trying to take over everything. So, I don't know. I could see... I could see it playing some sort of effect. I'm just not... sure how much bearing that is really going to have i think whatever you know they do decide is sort of going to happen regardless yeah and, and that's where like I, I really hope they don't do what the, the description is suggesting and do the she's actually evil again and like they just did all this setup to just lead to her being evil again like it would be a cool twist it would get people talking for a while but ultimately we'd, we'd just be i think back on track to like defeat kuvira again and eventually to the actual redemption arc so why not just do it here and move on with things so yeah we wait for part three uh february 25th is the release date for that book so uh, not too far away actually you know it's only like what three months away so that's pretty good uh the the time between part two and three is actually fairly quick this time and uh yeah we're, we're pretty much just waiting for you know the announcement of what the next core comic is what the next avatar comic is especially with the core comic it's going to be interesting like you know if we see Kuvira on the cover again, um, or or what, that 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 could be pretty interesting. But um, yeah, we 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 continue to wait for that. I think you know it, it it pretty much has to be like any week now that they make those sort of announcements, given that they just announced the the omnibus for the promise, like we discussed at the start. I hope they're in you know get in that mode where they're getting the sort of uh, product listings prepared for to announce what's coming next. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I suppose we'll just end with that. Greg, do you have any thoughts on like when do you think they'll make those announcements as we get ever closer to the end of the year? Yeah, no, I would think that they would do it before the end of the year. Um, but I don't know, maybe they'll do it, you know, sort of, I don't know, maybe sort of at the end, sort of when this book is coming out. I mean, usually they do, you know, sort of prep it, you know, a couple you no know, months or so beforehand. So I would think that it would be coming up pretty soon. Yes. Uh, and I just hope that uh, 2020 is going to be our Avatar Year of the Fire Nation. That would be a cool thing to do because, like, we already have, like, the the Iro book from Inside Editions that's, like, Fire Nation focused. Uh, I think one of the things we know about the Kyoshi novel is that she's probably going to go to the Fire Nation to meet the Fire Lord because um, uh, of something the FCE said on Twitter. It would only be fitting that the, the comics as well focus on the Fire Nation, which is where... We want to go in Korra, and it's where most of the plot points are in Avatar comics. But uh, yeah, that's been our review for Legend of Korra, Runes of the Empire, Part 2. Um, and next podcast um, will either be uh, us doing some sort of a podcast on the Dragon Prince Season 3, which I believe is airing next week, uh, or it will be our uh, kind of a re-review, taking a look back on the Search comic. We still have to organize uh, what exact way we're going to do that. Um, but uh, it's going to be one of those. Uh, so, yeah, that's been myself and Greg. Thanks for listening to this podcast, and bye. Bye-bye.